welcome to another War Game Review from the Players8.com. My name's Alexander. And I'm Grant. Today we're taking a look at a brand new game, which is off camera. <laughs> <laughs> we're playing uh, 1979, Revolution in Iran. And uh, this is a very new game. Uh, this it is... came out like three weeks ago. Yeah, this is fresh off a of Kickstarter from the Dietz Foundation, which is a, a non-profit organization. Um, the game's designed by Dan Bullock. We've played at least one of his other games. He he's a cool dude. I I feel yeah. like his design mind is pretty interesting. He always he's always doing something new. Yeah. Uh, now, with that being said, this is a two player card driven war game. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know the newness it, is the novelty within that system and the setting, frankly, as well. So mm -hmm. uh, this plays in about ninety to one hundred and twenty minutes. I would. We play. It was more than 120 minutes for our first time playing. Oh, it, was, it was way more than that, but it was yeah. because we were reading all the cards. It's just like Twilight Struggle yes. where you, you're you going to have to read the cards to understand them. You're going to have to ask questions. You're going to have to refer to the rules. Yeah, That's and, just part of it. You know, it comes in this like nice little small cute box, and it seems yeah. fairly innocuous. But this game is kind of intense. Oh, there's no doubt. Uh, like, how playing this felt like in a way, kind of the first time we played Twilight Struggle. Mm -hmm. Like, we played a ton of card-driven games. Mm -hmm. I know card-driven mechanics. That's that's easy. But, like, what you're trying to do and trying to make it work and how and where to accrue points and when to accrue points mm -hmm. without harming yourself on the map, there's a lot of nuance and a lot of strategy there. Now, yeah. this was our first play, and we kind of just did it. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, you know, I'll, I want to play it again. To, uh, it, will, yeah. it will be very different. Well, I, I feel like the, it's a cheeky little game. I, I'm going to say that. Yeah. And what I mean by that is there's a lot here yeah. that isn't seen from the from the initial glance. Yeah, when you look at it, you're like, look at all these cute pieces in this very small map. And you're like... Oh man, there's a mm. lot. There's a lot in this box. It's very there's just a lot of, of ways to do things, and 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 the the two factions, the royalists, who are kind of the 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 ruling elite. Yeah, it's in, like a military style Iran. dictatorship. Yeah, they're you know they're in control. They're trying to build their little estates. They're trying to take the money and take it away from the country, basically, and. Then Iran is kind of the insurgents. Yeah, you got the, co sorry, the coalition. The, the coalition. And it's, you know, socialist and Islamic insurgents. And Mujahideen yeah, forces. Yeah, well, and, it, and, it, and it develops into, like, guerrillas yeah. and, like, extremism for the actual revolution kind of at the end as yeah. well. That's That was also something that was very cool is the faction kind of developed and changed over the course of the mm -hmm. game where mm -hmm. you're adding in bits and pieces and... For Just, both of us. Yeah, and those For bits both and pieces then add capabilities or yeah. change kind of the dynamic of the place. It was very, very neat. Yeah. But yeah because there's a, 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 quite a few moving pieces considering the size of the game, You there's there's a lot to consider. And yeah. the next few times that you play it, you're going to get it more and be probably better at it and understand yeah. more cool, intricate strategies. Well, like that. you know, as we normally do, we debrief. You know, after we play it, we talked for 15 minutes saying, yeah. oh, okay, I, I understand this better now. I maybe would have done this. Yeah, like I goofed so hard doing this. Or yeah. like, oh, I should have been more proactive in, yeah. you know, doing this early on. Or I should have abandoned ship on trying to do that and done something else. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. The The playbook kind of talks a little bit about strategies. And I, and I think we, maybe we should have read that a yeah, little more we, in depth we before. Yeah, we did And yeah, I... Fully even, recommend doing that. Even to the point where one of my greatest uh, abilities at the beginning, beginning of the game is to protect my oil resources. Yeah, you like have to do that. And, and I think I put one military piece <laughs> in there because I was thinking more traditional, oh, I'm going to wedge you off here and I'm going to try to block you in there. You, you don't do that. That has that, that no bearing upon the game. Yeah, not really. Um, but but I, I do think that this game is going to be rewarding to those that play it multiple yes. times to understand not only the cards that are upcoming but the different nuances in the elements of the game this game actually contains several kind of mini style games embedded yeah. in the design from the leader cards and that stability check where you're trying to get trying to get your leader out of power because you can score points with your leader yeah by 
burying your cards underneath him. And, and once you do that, there's nothing I can do to get those away from you, but... I just need to get you out to stop you doing that. Yeah. Get my guy in so I can start doing y- it. Yeah, and it, so, so that's an interesting little element. That t- kind of ties into the the reserve part down here as well as this... There's this nationalization track where you're you're trying yeah. as the the coalition's desperately trying to it's like an auto win yeah nationalize the the oil production basically so it doesn't go to everyone else and yeah so you know it it becomes this nice social democracy so to speak yeah. and so you know the oil isn't just for the elites and the shahs yeah and so I'm trying to do all these oil strikes and demonstrations yeah like. It's it, it's easier to kind of do those early because mm-hmm. then you have like some blocking capabilities later. And it's is there a point at which I did really poorly on those and need to just give up? Yeah. Or is there a tipping point where I just need to like keep going harder on? Yeah. It? Or did I just funnel these resources in and it was a hopeless cause? Yeah. Lots of really cool choices to make. I really liked your CIA MIC. Yeah, that advanced. was very interesting because it just you know. A bunch of your cards had these special symbols on that would go into this box. If they were there at the end of the game, minus one victory point each. And, and I had so, a lot of them. And so it's this toss-up <laughs> between, is this event good enough yeah. for me to get the minus one victory point? And sometimes it's not just, are they good enough? Is it good enough at this moment? Yeah. Because there were some I was like, ooh, that would have been really good last turn. And and those are ones I should not have played. And so then you're like, yeah. But, it's, but then it's also the layer of, is it good enough for me to play this to risk the minus one? Yeah. And will I be able to remove that with extra APs later? Like, and my, my argument very with that tough. is the, the mechanic of removing those cards, it requires a three AP card or three AP. So you could use some of your reserves. But that's so expensive. But it's a big commitment yeah. to simply remove one, one negative victory point. Yeah. What you got to do is you can't play those. Yeah, or you, you in, really got to be choosing. Game, it is yeah. it's very intense. The choices are very tough at times. Yeah. So, so I almost saw that as another mini style game yeah. where it was kind of a, a, a Russian roulette style thing. Frankly, yes, I, I'm going to play this card, but I know it's going to hurt me in the yeah. end. Does it benefit me more at the moment that I decide to play it, or is it really going to weigh, weigh me down and in the end going to? Bury me. Uh, yes. And and I, you know, for, for CDGs, I enjoy the style of ones that are like this, mm-hmm. where it's yeah. almost like I'm trying to spin a hundred plates. Mm-hmm. Where there's, you can't neglect this one. <laughs> yeah. You might only be able to tap it enough to keep it going. And it's trying to, just trying to get, get everything together and not just like collapse. Yeah. And that's always an interesting exercise. I enjoy doing that. Some of my favorite CDGs kind of, it's yeah. similar to that. Yeah. And this definitely has that in kind of shed loads. The, the other thing we haven't really talked about a whole lot, you, you know, you're battling for influence, but you're not traditionally battling yeah. for control. It is battling for the ability in a certain space, a city space, to be able to do what you want to do. You want to do these demonstrations and yeah. these oil strikes, and and I'm trying to stop that. By having my military influence there, yeah, to like put that down as soon as yeah. I try. Which ultimately, what it is, it's a it becomes a dice off, but there are modifiers. Yeah. So if I have three or four military influence pieces there, I get plus three or plus four to that roll. All of a sudden, it becomes yes. very hard for you to to really realistically accomplish. Or it. I have to have gotten a bit lucky with my influence draws to have good yep. size counters. And commit a big card to flip all of those over at one go. Or I've got to like move guys in. Yeah. Like organizing a really good one, you know, I'd have to be lucky or it takes a lot of planning. I, I, I would say not lucky, but it, it takes a lot of planning. It feels a lot like you play, when we play Labyrinth, you're almost always the job. Yes, yes. Because I can't stand it. Because <laughs> I'm not good at that, right? You're good at biding your time, thinking about it, trying to move this piece into there and replace this piece with yes. that and, and get this little extra element in there. And then combining all those elements together in one fell swoop to say, I'm turning over, I'm going to use my three ops card to turn over three guys that I have here. And the three that I'm going to choose to turn over are my best guys, the threes. Yes. And all of a sudden... I have nine power and 
Grant, you have to try to outroll me that at plus three. So I'm going to have to roll a six. So, so that's what this is, right? It's about biding time, yeah. trying to understand, trying to get the best opportunity. And that element, I really, I would not like to play that side. I'm just going to be honest. Sure, that's sure, hard sure. for me. I, I can understand that. I, I struggle with that. You I have, need more practice at that. Yes. You have to be a very proactive coalition player in yeah. this. Especially because the, this game has an arc in it. Mm -hmm. uh, like, the coalition starts with their leader in power. Uh, he will leave the game. Yeah. Uh, either through, like, turmoil and losing your stability checks, or, like, by turn four, like, he buggers off. Basically. Yeah, yeah. So, like, early game, you're like, throw as much influence out there as possible. Let's get some oil strikes going. Mm -hmm. Go, go, go. You, like, have to go really hard, and you're being very proactive of, like, moving guys here, trying to do an attack, make you do yeah. a roll. Doing it here, doing it here, doing it here. And then, like, then he goes away. And then the Shah comes to power. And then your game changes completely. Yep. Uh, because by that time, usually the Royalist players kind of build up some strength. Mm -hmm. And now you're like, well, I was doing those oil things. Now I'm like, let's go to the regular cities. Let's do labor strikes. Yep. And then I'm moving, I'm moving my pieces and influence elsewhere, which forces you to kind of follow me and yeah. it's that little bit of cat and mouse but you can't take too many away from the oil fields just in case i yeah. go back and hit that up uh, unless you've played the card as the uh, royalist that eliminates that yeah. ability to win in that way that that becomes very powerful because i can remove that as a victory condition for you and guess what i don't have to worry about those oil places anymore but N not as much i still also, have to worry about them neither but. do i well, so it's it, yeah, it frees up a lot of stuff, and it just totally changes the game. But then, like, yep. I'm desperately then once the Shah's in power, basically the only thing I care about is toppling him. Yeah, because if I can topple him, he's gone. You lose the capacity to then the, stick any more. The cards Ayatollah in the game. comes into power, and the game is going to end. Game ends immediately. Yeah, and I get five victory points. Yes, yeah. so it's very strong. It can be you know, but you've got to get there, and all at that yeah. point. The Royalist is just doing everything they can mm -hmm. to stamp out all the resistance, yep. like eliminate all the guerrillas, and uh, keep their support up as much as possible, and uh, just kind of hang on and claw their yep. way to the end of the game. Yeah. I, I, I did, in reading the playbook and kind of the strategy synopsis, it mentions the Royalist kind of has the more stressful game because they're kind of on a knife edge of losing. Pretty yeah. consistently. And, and we talked about this. Yeah. The Royalist player does a lot of stuff to not lose. Yes. Rather than trying to actually win, it's like, oh, yeah. I gotta I gotta make sure you can't do this. And just, you know, so, that's not my favorite thing to do in a game. I, and, and I'm okay with it, except I hate the, the lightning bolt cards. Yeah. That, that, that yeah. land reform... It's just like, I I'd like do, your victory points, please. Yeah, Thank I, you. I worked so hard to get a, a royal estate established and got rid of all these cards and used. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, I'm just going to take that from you. And it's like, oh, man, that just hurts. Yes. And the only way I can really stop that is to get that card, because there's two of those in the deck. Yes. And then bury that card where you can't get it. Yes. So to get that card, it being aligned to the coalition... You have to have drafted it. Yeah. And that's one of the other big parts of this game. Uh, you deal eight two piles of eight cards, and you draft those back and forth. Yeah. And we've had a, a lot of discussion about it, and it's like, it adds this little kind of chunk to the game. Well, it's a time. time. It's a time commitment yeah. that we kind of debated back and forth, was it really worth it? Yeah. D does what this adds offset the time, the, the time commitment it is? Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's some interesting choices, right? Like, it's the opportunity to draft that land reform card to yeah, keep it away get from it away you. From... And if I'm if I'm in charge, mm -hmm. I'm going to take your good cards so I can bury them. D depending right? on who's in, in power. But, yeah, but you're, like, you're absolutely right. Yep. But, but, like, it is... It's like this extra little thing that you kind of have to do. So yep. just know that kind of going into it. I, I feel nice. like there's about three or four different things that, like you said, spinning the hundred plates. It's... You can't necessarily forget all of them, but you you got to focus on different ones at different times, yeah. and that's always fun. That that's why I do like these card driven games because it is that yes, it, it's that exercise in futility. I'm going to keep doing this and this and this and this to stop you from doing what you want. 
But in doing so, I you, can't win. You don't get any positive. Yeah, you yeah. just prevent me. And, and so and where that's is, the balance. Yeah, yep. love it, love it. So also a topic that was interesting. We learned about this. Reading those cards was very cool. Seeing how they interacted, very cool. Playbook's got a whole bunch of notes. Yep. Like his, this is a little bit of like a three lines of history on every single card in the game. Yeah. I believe uh, that was also neat. Was to explore this. You know, I've heard about the revolution in Iran mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. But playing through it, getting the hands-on experience. I'm sure yeah. what we did was somewhat a historical, but like interacting with it, reading the cards, seeing yeah. the kinds of events that were going on. It's always an interesting experience to find something new as well. And isn't that one of the reasons we play these games? Oh, absolutely. That's you absolutely know, why we To do. try to mimic or, or redo or model history and see how the outcomes could have been different. Yeah, or to even, I don't know, I don't even... So I know people do that, where yeah. they're like, oh, I want to see how good of a model this is, or I want to try and do something different. Yeah, that might be a bad. No, way they do. Of That's absolutely it. thing. Yep. But like with something like this, that I kind of, I don't really know mm -hmm. what was going on. All I know is that the Ayatollah has got his power. Yeah, yeah. Like, what I'm here to do is to kind of play around in the sandbox mm -hmm. of what was going on to to see, like, you know, oh, this was an important part of it. Oh, there was this extra oil resource that isn't part of a city that represents something mm -hmm. like just just to kind of push around and explore stuff is yeah. you know i'm not at the level where i'm like i'd like to like i don't know enough about this to like sure. i'd like to try this other cool thing yeah, i'm just yeah. not there yet yep yep and that's kind of more how i roll yeah. but uh, what i'll do is i'll show you the board and how it looks and how it plays and then we'll wrap up with some final thoughts so this is the map and as you see it's quite small, um, and I believe it's 22 by 17, and there's a number of holding boxes. So, so really, the actual play area is just this. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. It's, you're fighting over 13 spaces with connections. That's what you're doing on the board. Um, the rest of this is kind of holding boxes for any active events or for the... Uh, <clears throat> for the royal player, you have uh, a, just a holding box for estates, which are going to score you victory points. There's this CIA MI6 box, a couple event markers, and then the, the more important here, we've got the leadership kind of holding box with the support and opposition tracks, nationalization track, and then your reserves here as well. So, it's a, you know, at its core, it's a CDG. So, you're going to have a hand of eight cards. The red ones are coalition aligned, the white ones are royalist aligned, and these green ones are neutral. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to have eight cards, and the opponent's going to get dealt eight, eight cards, and you're going to draft them. So you're going to pick one, switch hands, pick one, switch hands, pick one, and go back and forth and back and forth. Um, once you've done that, whoever's in power, so whoever's symbol is shown on the leader, they are going to start... So we're actually going to, if, if the Ayatollah ever gets into power, game's over. So we'll put the Shah back into power here. So then the uh, the Royalist player is going to basically go first. And what you're trying to do in this game is, as with there's a lot of games, is score victory points. Uh, what you can do is, um, the main way that the Royalist player is going to score victory points is by um, investing in these Royal Estates. And you can pay uh, a lot of your action points on cards to put one card down here. And then you mark that you have established a royalist estate here. If at the end of the game, you're going to get three points. You can also kind of take one of your, take one of your cards and you can uh, royalist card bury it. You can stick it underneath your leader. You can bury it. Instead of using your resources, you kind of squirrel them away. This is going to score you victory points because you're, you're just trying to like, it's a, it's a bit, you know, it's on the corrupt side. If you think about what you're doing, you're taking your resources, you're hoarding them, you're tucking them away in your own royal estates so that, you know, when the game ends, you're either extremely rich or if you are ousted from power, you're, you know, you, you've accumulated a whole bunch of wealth, basically. And it's the same thing for the coalition player. They actually start the game in power. Uh, you have Mossadegh, 
and uh, he, he has the capacity to stick them under here, but he doesn't have the capacity to do these royal estates. That's only for the royalist player. Now, um, what they're trying to do is, you've you got this Islamic socialist coalition, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to nationalize oil production. So it's not just in the power, in the hands of, I don't know exactly, presumably oligarchs at the beginning of this game, or like individual privateers, but you are trying to get it nationalized, and you do that by conducting oil strikes, and as you successfully do them, your nationalization goes towards this. If you ever get to the end, you insta-win. Um, and uh, the uh, But if, you, if this fails, because this gets very difficult to do, or if it's kind of getting blocked, or there's not really any hope, you're then trying to get this guy out of power, replaced with the Ayatollah. That's going to end the game, score you some victory points as well. That's that's another way to win it, and then um, the other thing that you're really looking at is if trying to affect the uh, this opposition and support, because that's how you're going to change these regimes. So there's a couple, you know, everyone's got a couple of different other ways to kind of end the game and score their points, but the real driving force between this regime change are what's called stability checks, and at the end of each turn, of which there's at most seven, you're going to roll. Uh, an opposed die roll, and you're gonna, if you're in power, you add support, so we roll the five, six, seven, eight, that's extremely good, and if you're not in power, you roll plus opposition. One plus zero is one, very, very bad. If opposition, <coughs> if opposition outperforms support, then what you can uh, what you can do is um, normally you know it, it's going to change hands. So he's going to be ousted. You put a new guy in. Um, you know if it's the Ayatollah that's going to end the game. Uh, you can only do that after he's come into power. There's a couple other guys in the kind of early mid game that it can be. Um, but if you roll really poorly, um, as the person in power, what you can do is you can start sacrificing your influence on the board to re-roll. And it's kind of, I don't know if it's like, represents this extra level of commitment. You can remove influence from the board and roll again. And you kind of hope for a better result. Uh, you know, one plus three is four, two plus zero is two. Great. That was, you know, I weakened my position. I really like called in a whole bunch of favors, committed some troops, things got a bit violent but we were able to maintain power. So you do have a way to fend this off. It isn't just a die roll. You've got to commit resources to, to redo it, but I really like that it's not just a die roll and then, you know, bad things happen to you, basically. I like that it's not just luck-based. Um, so the main part of this is putting guys out, moving them around so that you can conduct activities and those activities are going to affect this opposition and support. So, if I'm out of power, the coalition player, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to raise opposition. Uh, um, and if I've got events that can erode support, I'm going to try and do those too. But how do I go about raising opposition? Well, I'm going to conduct labor strikes. And what you're going to do is, as the coalition player, you've got all these little discs kicking around. Um, those are your influence points, and kind of like a coin or a labyrinth game, they have a symbol on one side, on the back, th they have a value. It's just kind of like their ready side and their active side. On their ready side, there's no number, they represent one influence each. On their reverse side, once they become active, they can represent anywhere from one to three. So revealing them can be very powerful. So to do a labor strike, you're going to kind of pick an area, and say, so we'll, we'll pick here, and... Uh, you're going to play a card. Let's say I've got this two. Well, it's, that's a royalist event. Here, let me get it. <laughs> Here, I will play one of ours. We're going to play the two points, and I can reveal two of these um, discs. Now, I've got four, but I can only reveal two. If I've got a three card, I can reveal three. It can be quite powerful. So I'm going to reveal two, and we're going to do... Let's say you flip... Well, we'll flip these two. This two and a three is five. What that is, is that is now, they're going on strike. They're out in the open, marching in the streets. 
So now the, the player who's in power, who happens to be the royalist, they are going to make a die roll. And they're making a die roll to try and meet or exceed your five target number. On a d6, that's quite difficult. But you're going to get some modifiers. You get a modifier for each military unit that's in there. So we're going to be a d6 plus one. If you have any reserves, you can, before you roll, commit any number of reserves that you want and get positives at a one-to-one -one ratio for that as well. We don't have any reserves, so we're just gonna roll a d6 plus one. I rolled a four plus one, it's five. Five meets that number, we're good. If you roll under that number, the labor strike is successful, and the opposition's gonna go up. If you had reserves and you hadn't committed them, the coalition player's then gonna roll a die, and on a one, two, or three, they lose a reserve. Or oh, nothing happens, and then on like a four and a five they lose two, and on a six they lose all their reserves. So, you know, it's it represents an extra level of commitment that had to be made to kind of, as a result of that. So, that's a labor strike. Oil strikes function very similarly, except that they only occur in these oil um, denoted regions. So very early on, the Royalist players desperately trying to protect those. And you're doing that because, like we kind of mentioned earlier, instead of it, uh, you know, affecting a lot of other bits and pieces, the most important part is if your oil strike is successful, this nationalization track goes downward. And the more it goes down, if you can get it to zero, the game is immediately over, the coalition player immediately wins, and you don't calculate any victory points. Again, this is extreme. It, one, two, three, four. This is you have to do four successfully, which is very hard. And at some point, there's this A AIOC withdrawn event, which it adds a blocker, so you have to do an extra one. So really, you're looking at five. Um, and then there's also a card in the late game that just removes this entirely. So this basically ceases to become a functional part of the game. Now. This is where that card drafting comes in. If you're the coalition player and you see that, you're like, well, this event is not good, but I'm going to draft it so I can then maybe hide it under my leader and bury it so that the opposition doesn't have access to it, so that they can't ever remove this and I can keep hammering away at it. Lots of cool choices to be made in this, but really it's a game of using your um, activity points or your cool events to place influence. Um, well, it's almost all out on the board. Um, coalition influence comes from a random cup draw, and then you're kind of putting it out, so you don't have a lot of control over what it is. You have volumetric control of how many guys you put in there, but, you know, this guy's got three, two, and one, and a two, that's pretty strong. But you might have, like, a bunch of ones. Um, and then it's the, the, uh, the military influence is trying to get put out to protect those, to give positive modifiers against... Um, oil strikes or labor strikes that are going on. In the late game, you get these guerrillas coming in, or mujahideen, depending on which side, uh, well, yeah, kind of the theme of the event that's going on. Those are guerrillas trying to fight those. If you can get them into Azerbaijan, um, you can get some points that way as well. And it's this back and forth struggle, lots of depth, lots of specificity in the events. Trying to get some of them to trigger is kind of like, why am I doing this? But if you if you know this, the more you learn, it's like, oh, I can make this happen and some real cool effects go off. But all in all, once you know this game, it's fairly short. Uh, partly that's because it can end very quickly. Uh, if someone did was doing really well on the oil strikes, or if they had, you know, turn four, this guy auto comes into power if he hasn't already. And if, you know, if this, you can do really well with some labor strikes and get a good roll, the game, the game can end on turn at the end of turn four. It can happen. It's unlikely, but like you can end the turn, the game quickly. Um, but you know, at most, this is you're looking at really a two hour game for seasoned veterans if you play the whole thing. So it's a very very interesting game. What we'll do is we'll wrap up with a few final thoughts. So that was a look at the map. Uh, small map fits in this tiny little box with a deck of two decks of cards. Really, it's actually a really great package. Yes. I, I think it's well done. It's well constructed. It's well put together. Um, it, it definitely comes off as, ooh, this is a cool little, you know, little game. Yeah, looks great, and a lot of depth to this game also. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we've played a lot of CDGs, and there are some card-driven games where, like, you play it once, and you're like, yeah, I've seen everything in this. Yeah, yeah. Like, 
oh, you get a real good gauge for like what this is about. Mm-hmm. This this game at the end of it, I was still like, huh? Yeah, there is a lot more to unpack here. And I think a lot of times with these games, have we had we played this three or four times? It's like peeling the layers of the onion back. You would have known. Oh, okay. At this point, this card really is important to me. And yeah, it's. A, I, I think in our play. Oh, I didn't know the Cuba card was there. Right. right exactly. <laughs> it's every time. You know, I didn't know I could put all this influence here and work my butt off for you just to say, "Yep, that's mine." Sorry. <laughs> yeah. This. You know, and and that's part of what CDG CDGs are: understanding what your opponents' events can do. Yeah. Well, the ca- capacities and, and how to minimize that negative impact, and, and that's what makes this you know, vehicle for, for board games, very interesting. Yes, I, I think is I agree. trying to do what you need to do, but also trying to minimize what your opponent does to you. That's bad. And, and you know, um, we talk about a lot of CDGs in this way. If you play this with the same person and you mm-hmm. play it again and again and again, you will grow together. You'll yeah. grow probably at the same or similar rate mm-hmm. and you will be, extremely good and competitive against each other. Oh, yeah. And I think that that's one of the really rewarding parts of CDGs. Yeah. It's like, we're playing at, like, this level. Mm-hmm. But after, like, ten plays, we're playing at this level, but we're yeah. both at that level. You know, it's interesting. We, we played Twilight Struggle a couple of dozen times, and it, it is very interesting. When I'm the Russians and you can see what I'm doing, we know what each other is doing. Yeah, you, you, right? you, you get into the strategies yeah. and the meta strategies, yep. and it's... Awesome. The levels, yeah. And, and this has that. It's... I'm actually, I agree with you, and I'm surprised that it has it, because this is such a small little game. Well, and But it has that. I'm not surprised, because it's Dan Bullock. Yeah, but it's, uh, but like, who he is. it's so nice to see it in such a kind of a tight package. Yeah. Where it would be quite easy to make, you know, something that's like fairly light, fair, yep. and, you know, is quite stripped down to the bones. This thing is extremely tight. And yeah. a lot of the cards are... Um, very specific and very explicit. Mm-hmm. And once you play this, you're going to figure out, aha, uh-huh, I need a couple of these things to trigger this to maximum effect. Or yeah, like, yeah. I can use this as this kind of bomb in this way to like yep. springboard on something else. And you'll get more and more of that nuance. And I, it, yeah, it's an extremely well constructed design from that standpoint. I, I really wish that white revolution card was not the literally <laughs> the, the bottom literally card of the, the deck. Last of the deck. <laughs> um, that would have helped me quite a bit. But that that's the cool thing about it. Next time I'll know to look for that card and hopefully it won't be in, well, in yeah. the bottom of the deck. It'll come but that that's the great thing about this. You're gonna learn it through multiple plays. You're gonna learn it. You're gonna understand it better. You're gonna play off your opponent and you're gonna look for those things to you know, either to do what you need to do or unravel what your opponent yes, is trying to absolutely. do. Absolutely, I, I I really enjoyed this. I think I'd love to play it again immediately to get a better understand and feel for it. You're gonna have to play this. I'm gonna say four or five times to really even yeah begin to really grasp exactly what you're and, trying and to do. Yeah, and I think more than other games that we've played, this falls into that category mm-hmm. where we have very, very much just scratched the surface. Agreed. There is a lot in here mm-hmm. to to be excited and interested about. Yeah. And, yeah, you're going to be a long time before you're like, yeah, I kind of, like, know this game. Yeah. I think that's a long, a long way away. Yeah, I agreed. Which is huge credit to the design. Well, and, and, and I think, Dan, we've played his No Motherland without. Yeah. You know, that was a fantastic game on North Korea. Fascinating. Game. And it was... I, I don't know. I, I still think back to those couple of plays we did. How many years ago was that? Three or four? Yeah. And that game just came to Kickstarter, I think. Was it last year? Yeah, Compass, like Compass got it and put it out fairly recently. I, I enjoyed the heck out of that. And I, this game, to me, it f- f- fills the same niche. I, I feel like I'm going to get the depth and the... It's a damn bullet game. Yeah, it's just the way it is. You get and, you get things which are non-standard, yeah. and it is an interesting topic and an interesting discussion or like yeah ex- exploration of that thing. Agreed. Yeah, so, I really liked this. I really did. Yeah, 1979 revolution. Frustrating as hell, but I really liked no, it. No, yeah, and it was frustrating because I didn't know what I was doing. Now I feel like I know better what I'm doing, but it's still going to be frustrating because I'm still not going to get it. I'm going to get it better, but that's fine. That's what these games are for. Yes. You don't want it to be played one time and then I'm done with it. 
because yeah, I that's, whooped it. That's, you know? the, the, uh, that's always disappointing when it Yeah, does agreed. That. And there are some games where you're like, yep, uh, I get it. Yeah. This one, uh, you, you got some yeah. learning to do with this, which is very, very cool. So yeah, you also get to support an excellent uh, non-profit organization. Yeah. Uh, which is all about education and various scholarships that they provide. Well, and I think it's also about I think it's about the concept of using games. Yes. To teach, like to teach us, trying to get, and they have a, a couple other titles, and they've got a civil rights title on Kickstarter right now, I believe. Yeah. And all coming very soon, and so they like putting getting this kind of experience into educational settings. What a cool yeah. endeavor! What a cool way to learn, and, and obviously. We support that kind of thing yeah. because we want more more games. Yeah, agreed. Like excellent. Yes. So yes, uh, check this out if you're interested. The Kickstart fulfilled. I believe it's probably available at retail on their uh, website now as well. Uh, and you know, keep keep your fingers on the pulse of the Deets Foundation because they're going to have more games coming out, and it's always something interesting. Yeah. And uh, you you know, support. Can, can I make one negative comment? The stickers. Man, the stickers were bad. Yeah, they know. <laughs> they, they they peeled off. It was almost, they literally came off the entire sheet with the back yeah, on them. Yeah, were, the, the die cut went right the way through yeah. the sheet. So it was. Rather than stopping when it hit the back like, side. Yeah, of like it. halfway through. Or and, and, and I stickered this. And I'm going to be honest, it took me about two and a half hours. Yes. And I think by the end of it, I was about ready to throw it through the window. Because I, I just, trying to yes. flip well, that and off. They're very small. Oh, they're so. very small. This isn't CNC Napoleonics where you, it's yeah, big, right? These are tiny little. But if you can get past that, this is a fantastic, fantastically produced game. Yes. I, I just think they had a problem with that. Hopefully they fix that for future games and yeah. that's not a problem again. I hate to be a negative, but that was the one thing I'm like, oh my gosh. No, oh, yeah. That was horrific. The, the, the feedback from that was... Uh, yeah. Almost universal and very quick once the Kickstarter ship. But yeah, other than that, it's a beautiful game. Yeah. Yep. So yes, 1979 Revolution Around from Dan Bullock. Uh, check this out if you're interested. Appreciate you tuning in. I've been Alexander from TheBlazade.com. And I'm Grant.